Welcome to Thriving Entrepreneur with your host, Steve Kidd, third generation minister and 30 year business coach. Listen in as amazing, world changing authors, speakers, and coaches share their struggles and victories. And hear from best selling authors' insight into how you too can live your life as a thriving entrepreneur. This is Steve. Welcome to Thriving Entrepreneur. Thanks for being with me here today as we talk about some things that can make your life so much better. Things that you didn't learn in school, things that only when you get out into life, into the world, doing the things that you were called and meant to do, only then can you begin to learn some of the life's lessons and you can really be the best version of yourself. Sometimes learning comes with experience. It comes from knowing more than just what's found in a book. It's so funny to say it that way because what I'm going to bring to you now is three amazing authors with great books that are going to help us learn more than we learned in school and take us really far. Let's jump right in. We've got three really great guests. Join me in welcoming Matthias Omatola. How are you doing today, Matthias? I'm great and getting better. All right. I'm glad to hear it. So tell us a little bit about you and how you show up in the world. Yeah, definitely. So um, I've been traditionally trained in economics from the uh, University of Iowa and Illinois State and been in technology for a long time, really studied relationship and intimacy. Um, so a lot of people know me in the nerd world. And along this path, I found that a lot of artists and creatives really don't have the full skill set um, that they need to really feel strong and successful in the world. It's usually they have a creative aspect or a different aspect. So I'm really all about helping people connect to their authentic self, healing the different uh, man woman relationship problems to help, you know, like the spark of the golden age of humanity, where we're really working together and uh, living different lives than we do today. So tell us a little bit about your book. It's called the five most important things you don't learn in school essential knowledge and tools for success in modern society. Um, but before you get into your book, uh, you told us a little bit about you, but tell us what inspired you to write the book. Definitely. Uh, the biggest thing that inspired me was looking at and working with the younger generation, uh, my son, my nieces, as well as just the education system and helping them with homework, right? So <laughs> helping the next generation with homework and seeing what they're studying, what they're actually preparing for. And how does that translate into, um, you know, real life things that are useful to you on a day to day basis? And unfortunately, a lot of it doesn't transfer. It's not very clear on how the curriculum transfers into success and happiness as an adult. So when I saw that gap and then working with other professionals who have been you know, adults for a long time, working as creative professionals for a long time, I saw that there were different gaps that they just didn't know about certain areas because there was no curriculum for it. It just was not required for graduation and they were at a disadvantage in a number of different areas. So when I saw that, I was like, okay, what can I do to help bridge those gaps? Because I've studied a lot about just what is it like to be a human here? What do you really need to do to be successful from financial to relationship, to the health of your body, you know, to operating in the system? What is that? And, uh, I translated all those decades of information and interviews with amazing experts into a book that I was like, oh, just one manual that will give you the baseline to say, understand these different systems. And if you're good at these systems, you're going to be OK. If you're not, here's how you can work on them. Mm, love that. OK, so, you know, you've got to get the book in order to get the, all five of the things. But let's give them a little bit of tease. What is one of the most important things you don't learn at school? Yeah, one of the biggest things is communication and relationships, right? So everything that we do is relationships. Like, how do we relate to other people, both professionally and personally? And if you have a hard time relating or connecting with other people, you can do a lot of great things, but it's just not going to be as rewarding, right? If you just have to watch all of your movies alone, if you have to, you know, read everything, you can't talk to anyone about it. The human experience is best shared with people that you get along with. It's just one of the things that um, has been here since the beginning of time. And a qu quote from the book that uh, from Tony Robbins is, you know, the quality of your life will be determined by the quality of your relationships. So really helping people navigate conflict resolution 
and how to build and maintain healthy relationships. It's just something that's not part of the core curriculum in school, and it uh, leaves people at a real big disadvantage. Yeah, I've often said that we really need, um, you know, more than just learning how to form letters and stuff like that. We really need to reteach kids words. <laughs> you know what I mean? Not just to learn the word cat, but what is a cat and what does that mean? And what's unique about a cat? You know, I mean, that's a really simple word, but you know, that kind of thing about words really meaning things. Yeah, no, it's a big deal is, is when you understand not just the meaning of them, but how to apply and work with that system, right? So that's one thing is, you know, a cat is an animal. Okay, when working with pets and animals, how does that work? You know, what are some of the things you want to do? You don't want to approach an animal too quickly and aggressively. There's, you know, different things that you you want to do that just help you understand how to connect. And so that's what, uh, you know, that section of the book is really on. Um, another big one is um, health in the human body. And that, that was one that kind of took me by storm um, because I was an athlete, uh, you know, athlete, collegiate athlete, played in, you know, Big Ten football and in and, and these big leagues. And I found out how little I actually knew about like nutrition and my body. And it was like, what, how, how can I'm just kind of getting fed a bunch of calories and working out a bunch and just protein, protein, protein. But there was a lot of other things that I just didn't know. And then after interviews with experts on nutrition and just how to work with stress within the body. So we don't just cover like the body in general, but it's just overall like health, mental, emotional, physical so the, the whole the, all the multiple systems of the body so that was a a big awakening thing to me that we just don't really have a lot on and even talking with my brother who's an orthopedic surgeon after reading and sharing some books from experts he even changed up some of his diet and was like oh did did they teach you that in med school it's like no they didn't teach you that in med school so they you know there's so many different things that are you know related to the health and well-being of us and we get like so little little pieces here and there versus a comprehensive guide to say, all right, here you go. You can you can manage these. You'll be really good or great, probably. Yeah, I said one time in an interview, and she's still mad at me for it, that, you know, my mom was an amazing cook, but I don't know that I ever learned really what good, healthy nutrition meant. You know, because a lot of us, we grew up in an environment where what our parents was feeding us was more based on what they could afford than necessarily, uh, you know, the optimum perfect for your body style. This is what you should read. So that's really important. No, it's, it's huge. It's one of those things. I think we, a lot of us just eat culturally. It's like, Oh, it's just part of the culture. Like this is what's available. This is here. Um, if you're, if you're doing well, you're eating steak and lobster and these different things versus, like, what is, what do I need on a cellular level? Do I have that as a baseline? And sure, I'll have these little luxury foods every so often because I like how they taste, but I know my body's taken care of. And uh, for the most part, I don't think uh, in general, you know, 95, 98% of the population really even know what that is. And it's just part of the system. And that's why the book is there to actually talk with the people who spent their life dedicating to these different areas so it can actually increase the quality of life for people in the air, you know, all the different areas that are covered in the book. Mm, I love that. So is the book set up in such a way, I know this, but for the listeners, um, is the book set up in such a way that if what I really need to know is, okay, I want to just jump right to how to have, uh, you know, what to really learn about health in the human body, like we were just talking about, can they just jump to that and read that part of the book without having to have to read the whole book? Yeah, definitely. The, the, so the book is set up as a guide. And with the table of contents, you can go each to the, any one of the major areas and really looked at it as if you're just having trouble in this area, how can I get like immediate relief, right? Because we're living in the age of uh, instantaneous gratification. So I wanted to make it, you know, good for everybody that way, as well as myself, you know, some of these things I have to constantly review. It's not like, oh, yeah, I'm master of these of these five domains. Um, but I know that there's things that I, I need to reference back to. So the nice thing is at the end of each chapter, there kind of is a summary and kind of quick tips and life notes. So if you just wanted like a really good overview of some good questions to ask yourself to help set that all up, that's all there at the end of each chapter. So you can say, oh, okay, I can just jump into health in the human body, kind of run through this checklist and, and see where I'm at with that. 
So after a person reads the book, which they absolutely have to do, um, what are some things that you can help them with beyond the book? Yeah, definitely. So jump on to MatthiasOmatola.com, sign up and it'd be part of my mailing list. So one of the big things that I'm going to be focusing on next, besides getting this to as many people as possible, is helping people architect what I call your ultimate life blueprint, is now that you have a handle on these different systems, how do you actually build a structure for yourself that leads to your ultimate life? And it's not just what you think you should have based on you know external marketing. You should have a giant house and boats and all this. Maybe that is right for you, but what is really gonna ultimately bring you soul satisfaction that you can look back at your life and say, wow, this was the life well lived for me. I feel great about all the things that I've accomplished as well as I know how to accomplish those. I know why they matter to me and I have clearly defined steps. So that's the big thing is the book is all designed to help you understand all the systems and then working with me and, and putting together your ultimate life blueprint is so you actually now have a checklist that you can go through and you can incorporate and you can change habits. So every day you feel like you're building momentum and you're adding another block to your you know amazing kingdom, your castle, your whatever you're building. Um, you'll you'll have a really clear blueprint for that. Mm, I love that. So what is one of the things that yourself or somebody else that you've worked with on these areas has said to you, gosh, I wish I would have done that sooner? Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, one of the big things is like the rule of 72 when it comes to money and like how money can be working for you or against you and how long does it take to double and some of that the magic of that and if you're in the world of finance my background's in economics i love you know going into numbers understanding finance understanding investment strategies so that's one really really powerful one um, but the other big one is going back to health and nutrition and that's you know why do you eat what you eat <laughs> that's one of the big things that that kind of gets people and it is the aha moment or in, incorporating a little routine like one of the things that i tell people is i earn my shower so before the shower i just do a little set of exercises if it's push-ups one day if it's squats the next day if it's something like that that little routine and many people have told me they've started incorporating it and they're seeing a change so it's just one little thing that you can just make into a habit and these micro habits uh, the power of habit another great book is other you know great books out there that that talk about these things but i incorporate those and how you can you know simply add these into your life and how big of a difference that they have as well as in communication and relationships is some of the questions that i've guide people uh through that they said absolutely changed their life um, with one simple question that they've asked their lover their spouse or their child and they were able to get feedback in a way that changed everything. That one little question is, how am I doing? Right. And, and that's the, the one, one thing. And I asked about that, like, how am I doing as your boyfriend, as your lover, as your partner, as your husband, as your wife, as your, um, you know, as, as your father, how am I doing as your dad? <laughs> you know, what am I missing? You know, because we kind of get the, those employee reviews, but we never really have that. And that one question, that's part of the questions in the, in the homework and the, the quick tips section that uh people have told me has really changed especially when they had that conversation with their their son or daughter and they were able to get real true honest feedback and it builds a closer bond with them mm, i really love that yeah people are definitely going to need to get the book you can get it for free on amazon today the five most important things that you don't learn in school essential knowledge and tools for success in modern society um you know, Matthias, uh, give us your URL again so that we know how we can get in contact with you to work with you. Deeper. Yeah, definitely. My, my name is just Matthias Omatola. You can go to MatthiasOmatola.com, sign up to join the list. And uh, you know, I definitely want to say thank you to my designer, uh, Laura, who did the cover design, Laura um, Tolowatsky, um, and my uh, illustrator, Sierra Ward, and of course, Chris Doe for writing the forward. So every, there was a lot of support in this, and I just wanted to thank everybody uh, for supporting me along the way. So for anybody that's listening to this and, and isn't watching on the screen, Matthias, M-A-T-H-I-A-S, Omotola, O-M-O-T-O-L-A dot com. That's right. Perfect. I love it. Well, Matthias, thanks so much for spending some time with us here on the show today. Thank you, Steve. 
no commercials today. So many great guests that I just want to keep us moving right along. We're going to jump right into the next one right now. Join me in welcoming Elise Woodworth. Hey, Elise, how are you doing today? I'm great, Steve. How are you? I'm good, thank you. So start us off by telling us a little bit about you and how you show up in the world. Well, I am the president and founder of Woodworth Enterprises, where since 2014, we've been fulfilling our mission to ignite tomorrow's leaders, inspire today's, and help develop teams that shape history. This mission came out of a passion for helping organizations improve their culture. And how did I get into that? I was working in a pretty bad culture and I looked around and I said, I can do something to help people realize that they're in business, not battle. So what does that mean to you? We should say before we go any further, the book is called Business Not Battle for Nonprofit Board Members. Um, and you can get it today for free on Amazon. The link is in the thing, and I will uh, put it in the description in a little bit, too. Uh, so what does it mean to you that it's business, not battle? So what I've noticed is that a lot of times people get stuck. They get uh, frustrated. They get anxious. They get stressed out. And it's meetings. It's Zoom calls. It's reports, presentations, all of these different things. And you add on top of that personal relationship. And relationship is so important, but when it goes wrong, it creates tension and anxiety. And that is a battle. That's what I like to call a battle. And people get stuck there and they, so they stop seeing that it doesn't have to be about, uh, about that relationship, about battle all the time, that it can just be about business focusing on a mission and getting the work done, specifically in nonprofits. Uh, I've noticed that there is sometimes a lot of tension in the boardroom. Uh, a lot of times you'll see boards of directors and you have a really diverse group, which is great. But without the correct culture, let's say, without the uh, standardized how we communicate and what we're focused on, things can start to take a really tense, stressful turn. And it starts to feel like battle, but it doesn't have to be that way. Okay, so typically, not always, but typically when you're talking a nonprofit, um, even the board members are doing it because it's something they're passionate about, something they care about. You know, it isn't the traditional boardroom where you know, it's dog eat dog, we'll kill the person next to us if we have to, to make another dollar. <laughs> um, and yet it tends a lot of times, even in nonprofits to turn that way, doesn't it? It does. And the, what it really boils down to is conflict. Um, the, what happens is a, a really negative or you get into relationship conflict where you have a personal issue with someone and you lose sight of that mission. And what you, what I would like to have people do and what I encourage everyone to do is focus on constructive conflict where you're working on an issue and not an individual. There are some really simple ways that I talk about in the book that board members can become more aware of and recognize those battles as they kind of come up because they do those obstacles, those hurdles uh, that we all deal with in our life, those come up. And part of it is recognizing that you're in those situations and then being able to ask the right questions and encourage other people to be effective for the organization instead of getting stuck and mired uh, in these relationship conflicts that crop up so frequently. Makes a lot of sense. So let's back up for just a second. Tell us a little bit about your background and all the things you did that led up to Woodworth Enterprises. Sure. So we'll we'll start here at the present. Um, working with nonprofits was something that had been in the undercurrent for me for a long time. Um, I never recognized how I could help 
uh, in the nonprofit industry until really quite recently um, with sort of the end of 2021 and moving into to this year um, when I recognized that I could change my processes to help nonprofits specifically. Before that, I had been helping for-profit companies and other organizations work on improving their culture. And I did that through a process I call the Ignite model. And it combines gathering insight, developing innovative solutions and engaging the group to really create that transformational change that so many organizations are looking for. I, I shared a little bit earlier, but I recognized that I could do that while I was working as a contractor in a very negative work environment. And I had completed my MBA. I was just joining, joining my first board as a nonprofit uh, board member. Um, and, and I realized that I didn't have to stay in that negative or toxic environment. I didn't have to stay in that battle that I could focus on business. And so that's, that's why I chose to start my own company. Prior to that, I was an Air Force logistics officer where during my time in the service, I recognized my passion for leadership, for growing young leaders and teaching people the skills and, the, and giving them the tools to be an effective team. Uh, before that, I would have had no clue. Um, I was not a business. I didn't have a, a business mindset, but through the military and through my education at the Virginia Military Institute. Um, I was introduced to the concepts, the functions and attitudes as, the, as we would say at the I, um, the functions and attitudes of leadership um, and bringing those to other people and, and recognizing that passion while serving my country was really wonderful. While I was at VMI, I was a biology major. I liked to, uh, study ecology, botany, horticulture, these types of things. And um, while those are still passions of mine, they have become more of a hobby as the leadership, the business, and the really sharing that mindset with other people has taken more of a, a front row seat. So you went on and um, what, what did you do when you were in the military? I was a logistics officer, so they call us the jack of all trades. And in the Air Force, it combined supply, transportation, and then the traditional logistician career fields into one uh, giant career field specialty. <laughs> so basically for the Air Force, you were the person that made sure that there weren't supply chain issues. <laughs> Right. I, I had a lot of amazing opportunities in the Air Force that as a civilian, I don't think I ever would have uh, even known existed. Project management, for one, um, I had no idea. I, I had not been exposed to the idea of project management until one of my commanders said, you know, maybe you should focus on this. And, and it's something you can learn and you do it really well already, so study it. And uh, that's what I focused my master's in business on was project management. Turned out to be a really great fit for my life and has served me so well in understanding those concepts. Mm, I love that. We have an interesting question here. Does your book explore the power of implicit bias to sabotage communication, trust, and relationships? Well, not specifically. I will say that that concept, that idea there is a, is a battle, is a, a real and true, honest battle. And I think the way to confront that sort of thing would be by asking thoughtful questions, which is something that the book does cover. How to ask questions, when to ask questions, what to say, when to say it. Um, and as you identify those situations where things are taking a negative turn or something doesn't hit you quite right, rubs you the wrong way, um, those are the times where you stand up and you say, you know, let's take a look at that a little deeper. Let's go back and, and dive into that issue and ask questions. 
about it to gain understanding. Because a lot of times people have those biases and they're not aware. That's why they call it unconscious bias. But if you ask the questions, if you, if you encounter that from someone, a lot of times it's not intentional. And so asking those questions not only grows your strength in person in your ability to continue to grow and ask more questions, but it helps that person recognize that their behavior might not be in line with what they want to be projecting or what they want to say, or it might not be coming across the right way. So they need to change that. But without the awareness, uh, you end up stuck in that battle. But it's about business, isn't it? And just as a follow up, Stacy Walton wants you to know, thank you for writing the book. She knows that we so desperately need it in the world today. Thank you. So let's talk a little bit more about that concept. Now, person has to get the book in order to be able to learn everything. But much the same as asking you which of your children is your favorite, which I won't make you do. Um, <laughs> what's your, yeah, right. <laughs> um, what is the part of the book that is the most exciting for you right now, this moment? So I get most excited about the part uh, where I talk about being an advocate. Um, and this is something that I am still growing with as well, which is why it's really fun to have a book that helps me learn how to be my own advocate that I've written for myself and others <laughs> it's, it's interesting. Um, but in marketing this book, for example, um, the mission of, of getting the word out there uh, is something that I needed to do. It was my mission to market the book. And if I didn't talk about it, no one was going to ask me about the book or about what I was up to. So I had to become my own advocate and share that. Just as I talk in the book about it being so important for board members to become an advocate, a champion for their organization's mission. That is what the role I think of a board member really is. There's the governing, there's the fiduciary responsibilities, but organizations, nonprofits specifically, need advocates. And it's the board members who are in the role, they're in a position to grow the network, to spread the word about the mission. And if, if they're not willing or ready or able to stand up and say, this is a mission I'm proud of, this is a, something I'm excited about, then that is something that needs to be looked at as well. Because that's what's so needed um, for each one of us. There are things we'll stand up for. There are things we'll let go. And as a board member, I think it's really important to be able to stand up for your organization's mission. Mm, so important. Well, let's piggyback on that and talk about what happens to the organization when the board members don't stand up for it. It's it's pretty flat, I, I have to tell you. Um, it's really frustrating as a staff person. Um, part of this book and getting this ready, this is not just my experience. I interviewed many different organizations, many different roles, many different board members, different staff roles, um, different levels of experience, and, and asked them as well, you know, what's a good board member? What makes a productive board? Um, what makes an unproductive board? And what are some of those bad qualities that you wish didn't exist? Um, and so I've, I've combined all of those answers and, and it influenced the content of the book um, to kind of share that. But what happens when a board member or a board collectively isn't standing up for the mission? There are a couple different things. There's scope creep, uh, mission creep, if you will, um, which we talk about in project management a lot, but it's where <clears throat> if your, your mission is point A, you kind of lose sight of that and start to do what is interesting or what you want, and you end up not really achieving your mission or realizing your vision. 
um, if that mission isn't part of the focus. It's really easy to go away from. Uh, another thing that can happen is a lot of those battles start to creep in um, without a mission focus, without that unifying value of, of mission, of, um, of advocacy. Uh, there are a lot of loose ends crop up and you start to, to not want to go to the board meetings or not want to engage with the organization because it's stressful, because there are battles there. And by recognizing that and doing some of these things that help show you're an advocate and become an advocate for your organization, those start to clear up. And instead of those relation, well, you know, Steve came today and he was just against the whole agenda from the beginning. And I'm, I'm just not going to the next board meeting. Instead of that sort of attitude, you have something where it's, we, we have to realize, we have to figure out how we can get more meals to children in need. We have to figure out how we can, you know, unlock the cure to cancer. Pick your mission. But if it's, if it's about the people, it gets stressful really quick. If it's about the mission, it's a lot easier as a board to focus. So I'm going totally from personal experience here a few times, but what do you do when you're on a board with a person who has no interest in anything other than themselves? I mean, what do you do? <laughs> when they bring their own battle, <laughs> when they are, when they are the battle. That it, so one of the, one of the first things I would say in that situation is ask the thoughtful questions. Um, and, and have a conversation with them. I think communication, conversation is really the, the best weapon, if you can uh, excuse the pun, the best weapon you have against those battles is communication. So opening up and asking that person, you know, what's your focus here? Why do you come to the board meetings? But asking those thoughtful questions that are going to be open-ended and thought-provoking for that person might be all it takes to flip the switch. Might be all it takes for them to wake up and say, you know, maybe I, ooh, give them a copy of the book. <laughs> maybe it could be the, the uh, missing link for them. Um, because I believe each person has so much potential. And if they're on the board, if they've said yes to that role and responsibility, then there, there should be a way to unlock that potential. If there's not, and if they can't come up with a good answer, it starts the conversation towards, are you really necessary? Are you really uh, engaged here? Or could we find someone else to to fill the seat. It's like a coup then. <laughs> a small, uh, it's, uh, those thoughtful questions can be used in a lot of different ways, but in this case, it would be more like a wake up call. Um, are, do you have a passion for the mission? Or explain your passion for the mission. And, and having them think about those things, and if they don't have that, if they aren't willing to stand up and be an advocate, then it's maybe it's not the best fit. I'll even give you a perfect example, and this is totally from a church board, but you know, mm -hmm. big nonprofit. Um, I worked at a church and was on the board where, uh, you know, the church grew from seven people to 130 in about nine months. So wow. huge, explosive growth for any organization, you know, but especially in a in a church in a little town that, you know, that was almost everybody in the whole town was going because it was just a cool place to be. Mm -hmm. But one of the main board members, he had been everything, you know, he had he was basically the director of every group and everything in there. Mm -hmm. And it was quote unquote, his church, you know what I mean? <laughs> and it's that whole ownership. That's such a good thing, but that, you know, when, when the organization grows what you want it to, 
you know, now they've got to somehow be gently persuaded to not keep holding on to that stuff. You know what I mean? <laughs> so this is great, Steve. It, it all goes back to asking thoughtful questions. It really does. Um, that's the beginning of the Ignite model that I talked about in the beginning of this conversation um, is asking thoughtful questions, getting people to think through what's best for the mission, what's best for the organization, and having that awareness of their organization and that awareness of themselves and their own personal limitations and what they can offer that makes it so that it's not a relationship issue. It's not a battle issue. It's about business, or in this case, faith <laughs> and religion. Um, it's about growing that community. It's not about, you know, the pressure or the esteem of having that, you know, director role in each part. It's about growing the mission. And if it's the missions, if it's for the mission's sake, it can be a lot easier to explain, you know, we need someone else to take over this particular role, or we need more people to help because you can't do everything. And what you're doing is really great. So pick your favorite, you know, where do you want to focus your energy and attention? And let's find more support, uh, for those other areas of the mission that might be suffering because of time limitations, because of, you know, energy um, and burnout is, is real and something, especially in nonprofits um, and churches too, that you don't want to run into. You don't want a burnt out minister or an exhausted director. You want to have people that are, that have energy, that are engaged and able to accomplish their mission and what they set their mind to. So I always like to lead people in action and this is the thought that comes to my mind. You can answer something different if you think it's a stupid question. <laughs> um, but for the person who has decided, okay, I'm gonna do it. I'm going to help out this organization. How, what what should day one really look like for a new board member? So day one really starts before day one. <laughs> day one um, starts by picking up this book uh, when you are asked to join a board. And some of the earlier chapters, we talk about awareness of yourself. And it goes back to what are your strengths and weaknesses? Why are you being brought onto the board? And um, understanding that can really equip you to be the most effective board member that you can be for that organization because you have a, a clear understanding of what you're bringing to the table, why you're being um, asked to join or why you're coming to the table and you, you come in ready to ask the questions, to be an advocate, and to encourage other people to be effective for the organization as well. So leave us with some words of encouragement for whether they're new or they've been in there forever for board members of nonprofits. So words of encouragement, I think, um, recognizing that you don't have to be in battle, that it can just be about business is something that you can, you can pick that mindset. You can pick up that mindset, excuse me. You can pick up the business, not battle mindset anytime. It doesn't have to be when you start day one or two years in when you're starting to feel like you really understand things. Uh, and it could be afterwards. Um, when you're, when you are in the thick of things and you recognize one day that maybe it doesn't have to be done the way it's always been done, you can ignite change in your organization. You can encourage people to be effective along with you. 
you can spread the news and be an advocate for your organization. And it all starts with recognizing the mindset that you're in can be business, not battle. The book is called Business Not Battle for Nonprofit Board Members. It's written by Elise Woodworth. It's available today for free. In fact, let's just put the link in there in case you didn't see it in the description. Go get your copy right now. Elise, thanks so much for spending some time with us here on the show today. Thanks for having me, Steve. So many great guests and still one more to go. So let's not dally. Let's jump right into our third guest here today. Join me in welcoming Stephen Feinberg. Hey, Stephen, how are you doing today? That's fine, Steve. It's good to see you. Good to see you, too. So your book is called Do What Others Say Can't Be Done, Play the Metagame. Uh, first, though, tell us a little bit about you and how you show up in the world. Um, well, thank you for having me today. I appreciate it. Um, I'm pr- very excited about launching my new book. It's my second book. Um, so the in terms of what I do, um, I... I'm a neuro strategist, advisor, and executive coach to senior executives and entrepreneurs in the world. Uh, I, uh, in terms of neuro strategy, uh, people sometimes ask me, what does that mean? It's basically the field of brains, games, and foes, and especially game changing leaders is what I'm looking at working with and people understanding how to change their lives for the better. My intent is. Um, to advance civilization, one person, one leader, one entrepreneur, one coach at a time to significantly affect the trajectory of their life for the better. So um, maybe the, the, it's like, why, how did I come to the metagame? How did I come up with this idea of a metagame? Um, the, um, it's, metagame is a game of games. It's the, the game of patterns. And it's about connecting the dots. How do you connect the dots to see reality and see beyond the horizon? When um, the the most important move in the metagame is to stretch, not shrink. So um, perhaps I can tell you a story about my dad. When I was uh, growing up, uh, he owned, at one point, he owned an Italian restaurant and pizzeria in New York City. And we were... Uh, driving. He, he told me to get in a car. Usually he had me, I was the go do this, go do that kind of guy, you know, for the, for the business. Stephen, come here, do this. Come here, do that. You know, I was 17, 18 years old. I get in the car. He says, well, we have to go over to speak to the vendor. The vendor there uh, on the way there is the guy who sells all the cheeses and the sauces and the vegetables and all that stuff. We're driving over there and he leans over to me and he says, uh, the business is in a bad way. We may have to let some people go, and I'm not sure we can keep the business open. And I was like dumbstruck. You know, I was like, "Well, what does that mean?" I got really tense and nervous and uncomfortable. Um, and I was on my way to, about to go to uh, college for the first time, and I thought maybe that means I have to, I won't have a job. To, to pay for it. My parents won't be able to help me out. My, um, you know, my future plans all got, in that moment, got rattled. Um, and uh, we can, cont- and I, then I started worrying about the people who work there because we liked them. They were like family. And I said, everyone, this is really disruptive. We get, we get to the, um, to the vendor and he was going to negotiate with the vendor for better prices and to see if he could do anything to hold the business together. He had recently, the vendor recently raised prices about uh, several months before, and he was a pretty tough negotiator. My dad walks in uh, to him, says hello to all the workers there, and he walks in, he says, Joey, can I speak to you for a moment? And uh, he says, sure, Sam. We walk in, he walks in, my dad says, sit over there, Stephen. So I sit in a down in my seat and look around and I'm kind of worried but and he goes in he talks to him for about 15 minutes comes out and he's shaking his head and he goes over the water fountain takes water I said dad is it okay and he went, doesn't look good 
And I, my dad is the kind of guy who knew what to say, when to say in order to get someone to do something, usually me, right? To go make things happen. He was, he was a problem, problem solver in many ways, advantage maker. And um, he went back in to talk to, to Joey. And I sat there and the, the tape loop in my brain was, uh, it doesn't look good. It doesn't look good. What's going to happen? So my anxiety came up even higher. About 10 minutes later, he walks out and he goes, because his, the back of his right hand, back of his left hand, there's no one better than me, right? So he, he got a deal. He got a negotiation with, uh, with Joey. Everything was legal. Everything was ethical. And he got a loan on top of negotiated prices. And I went, what just happened? It was like, I had this feeling of triumph, not just winning, but triumph. And I wanted to know more of that. But more important to how I came to, to the work of metagames is I wanted to know what my dad did behind those closed doors. And this book is the book about how metagames play. How did he see the field of play? How did he read the room? How did he rearrange things? Such that what he did was get to get a great deal for him. And all he didn't play a zero-sum game. He played a bigger game. So he was looking at the game board and rearranging things, the game of patterns. And um, in that game, the rules are not fixed. And when you look at a metagame, one of the things that they do is they realize the rules are not fixed. And they can rearrange things. And that's what he did. And I figured out what he did. So, you know, I... Uh, before that, I used to. So I think that answers the question to briefly. <laughs> so most people are playing the short game, not the long game. How do you even change your mindset so that you begin to see the whole board and not just what's the smartest move to do next? Um, well, that's a great, I, I like that question because it, it gets to the heart of what it is that we're trying to accomplish here. And what I realized um, is that before that incident, when I was 17, 18, I grew up sleeping on a fire escape in New York City, right? And on that, and so how did I go from sleeping on a fire escape to a neurostrategist? How did I get there? And talking about with my dad, um, he was he was an entrepreneur, but he was also um, uh, he had a way of seeing things and a way of making things happen and way of going about doing things. And so the the one of the things I realized was that he was a first adapter, meaning he did three things. Every single person who plays a metagame, those three things, they see options on the board that others don't see. They defy expectations, doing what others say can't be done, and they persuade others to be able to um, exceed expectations. And so there's ways of looking at what's the, when I was on the, the fire escape, I used to look out and go, what's the game? What are the rules? And the rules are really important because they determine, they, they, in terms of communication, what, what's possible, what's desirable, what you want to do. And oftentimes, if you don't understand the rules of the game, you can be shut out. You can be shut down. So what's the rule in your head? You know, what's the rules that people are playing is very important. It's like, hurry up. Some people have hurry up messages. Some people have um, um, get it done, right? Get it done. Don't, don't rock the boat, right? Um, push harder. Those are all rules in your head. And so what you have to do is look at the assumption. As a neurostrategist, one of the things I do is try to understand how does the brain respond to these rules? And the, 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 the preset for your brain is, is, to, that is to resolve uncertainty. So when things come up, it's always seeking to resolve uncertainty. And the way it's your assumptions about that uncertainty, the rules that determine the actions that you take and, or don't take. Right. And, the, and situations, usually when pre problems occur, it's you're usually persisting in one of three things. You're either taking action you shouldn't take, not taking action you should take, or taking the wrong action. So you have to figure out those, that little calculus there and in the process of doing to unlock the game of patterns. 
So why don't you just change the rules? Well, sometimes you can, but oftentimes you can't, right? And so the 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 situation with my dad at the um, vendor, he did shift the rules. They weren't fixed. Sometimes you just have to adjust them a, a little bit. So um, I was uh, being I was giving a speech at Wells Fargo, and I was being introduced uh, by the CIO. And just before he's from, he, by the way, was from Brooklyn and I'm from the Lower East Side. So there was a little personal one-on-one joking around a lot. And I said to him, Barry, don't say that I'm a psychologist. Don't say I'm a shrink. It'll freak him out before, as you introduce me, we want to have this big, there's a hundred people. So we want to all set up a, a day of collaboration, we want to be open. So he goes in, sets up the, a great conversation with everybody uh, really sets up this idea of collaborating and how we don't usually do it and how you have to do it. And then he says, and by the way, Stephen told me to, to make sure I don't say that he's a shrink. And then he walks off stage. And then I walk back on, you know, walk on. I said, thanks a lot, Barry. I really appreciate that. This is your event. That's really terrific. I appreciate the introduction. And I looked at everybody and I said, how many of you want to be shrunk? Raise your hand. You know, a couple of people wanted the girth to be shrunk, but most most people, there was not a not a person raised their hand. I said, how many of you would prefer to be stretched? Everyone raised your hand. I said, today, what we're going to do is stretch you. Is that OK? And then we proceeded and had a great conversation. So by shifting the, the rule could have been in my head that I was stuck in that situation. But what I was trying to do is understand the uh, the muse hit me. Fortunately, I got lucky. You know, the muse hit me. And in fact, I discovered that that's one of the, the cores of metagames is to is stretching, not shrinking. So what is uh, one thing that a person who has never played the metagame before could do to start being able to start that journey in their own life? There are three things. One is you want to detect the game. You want to figure out what is the game that's going on to be able to see it. Um, to be able to figure out what are the steps, uh, you know, what are the patterns, what's going on here. The second thing is you want to break the pattern. So if you see yourself, if you have a pattern, you keep repeating it. The, the, if you, for instance, if you get in a situation where you get the one person gets angry, the other person uh, gets angry back, and then they get angry back. So it's an escalation. So you want to break that pattern. The pattern is interesting is that you could also get a person gets angry and the other person gets quiet and the quieter the other person gets the angrier they get the first person gets and so both are different there are different kinds of patterns but they're both happening and what you want to do is to break that pattern you want to do a 180 degrees uh solution approach to it you want to do something a little bit different so instead of pushing you might ask instead of um being quiet you might speak up if you're in a job and you you realize you're a good soldier, right? You're just doing what's being told and you don't understand why you're not getting raises or promotions. It could be that you're not, you don't, you're not speaking up for yourself in a way without being too um, uh, over the top, being able to look at it. The third thing you have to do is to frame the future, be able to shift the game, the game board, change the frame to change the game. You have to be able to, like I did on, uh, instead of shrinking, I said stretch. You change the frame and everyone switched to that frame. So you want to do, those are the three steps in being able to do it. You know, the interesting thing is that in any situation, if you're stuck, which is what you're talking about, if you're stuck, whether you're a leader, an entrepreneur, a parent, there is the seen and there's the hidden. The patterns are seen and patterns that are hidden. Both matter. Uh, this is especially true during times of uncertainty. When uncertainty strikes, you can see the threats, threats to your confidence, threats to your credibility, threats to your success. And in relationship, we can count winners, losers, and those people who play mediocre. But alongside, there's another game that is unseen by most, and it's hiding in plain sight with deeper rules, deeper deceptions, and players who know how to connect the dots uh, for deeper opportunities. This is the metagame. 
And winners notice what's missing and unlock the pattern. So if one person does three moves ahead and you move seven moves ahead, it's likely you're going to win. You'll be, you'll be able to see the game board. If you are walking down the street and you spot a pothole that the other person doesn't, you can provide safety and trust for the other person. So whenever you spot a pattern that's hidden, whenever you spot it as something that's hidden to the other person or connect the dots to see, you can um, provide, you, you're basically, there's an opportunity to create the exceptional. Because the book is really about how do you create the exceptional. And the metagame is an energetic game. You bring, it gives you energy. If you want credibility, if you want influence, if you want to increase your impact, then seeing what is hidden reveals how to create the exceptional. And that's, so the, those who miss the metagame, if you don't, can't see it, then you either fail or stay stuck. And of course, somebody needs to get the book uh, from Amazon today, but if they wanted to work deeper with you, how could they get in contact with you? Well, you can contact me. Thank you for asking. You can uh, contact me on my, uh, at my email at steven at stephenfeinberg.com. They could call me 650-279-9478. And what a lot of people think that, you know, because I've had a career that I had, and I've been fortunate and blessed and been able to, to work with these top people, that I'm not available to speak to. And I'm I try to make myself available for people who are interested, for who aspire to become um, game changers, who aspire to understand how to play the metagame in their business and their life. And, and to be able to um, move forward in those ways. The book is called Do What Others Say Can't Be Done, Play the Metagame by Stephen Feinberg, PhD. Stephen, thanks so much for spending some time with us here on the show today. Well, thank you, and I hope you all enjoy the book. Bye now. Do you feel like I do that you have learned so much more? And do you find yourself asking, why didn't I learn this stuff in school? Why isn't there classes on how to do this? It would help us so much in our lives, in our business, in our working and dealing with other people. Great, great things that help us be able to level up beyond just what we learned in school, just what we can read in books, which again is ironic given that this is books from three authors, but things that really take us to that next level because they also give us practical application of things that we can do in our life so that as we're out there being uniquely brilliant because you are uniquely brilliant when we're out there getting it done making a difference in the world created for a purpose and knowing that the world needs you when we're doing that we are living our best life we are living as a thriving entrepreneur and I appreciate on behalf of the whole of the universe, thank you for up-leveling with me today and for doing that thing that only you can do. See you next week. Thanks for listening to Thriving Entrepreneur today. If you want to get your question answered, send an email to questions at wehelpyouthrive.com. We look forward to you joining us again next time. author who's on a mission stand out with your brand out <laughs> check this out guys yep everything's marketing and marketing is everything your existing book can become a best-selling book or even hey like mine a number one international best-selling book in five days listen if your business isn't known by everybody it's obscurity and that's death right the same thing is true for your book if you're not happy with the way your book is performing you got that far and then it just fell off the face of the planet kind of feeling go to yourbestsellertoday.com schedule a talk with steve
believe. It's risk-free. It's guaranteed. It's proven. We've done it thousands of times. What are you waiting for? Yes, yourbestsellertoday.com. This time next week, you could have a beautiful seal on your book and get the attention that you deserve. Reach the people that you came to serve. Come on now. What are you waiting for? Grab a pen. Here we go. All you got to do is book a call, yourbestsellertoday.com. Go to yourbestsellertoday.com. Book a talk with Steve. It's proven. It's guaranteed. It's going to happen. All you have to do is say yes to your destiny. You